Hello and thank you for inviting me to present my work on geophysical signatures of ISCG deposits in South Australia. I'm Laszlo Katona, I'm a geoscientist and spatial data analyst with the Geological Survey of South Australia. In this presentation, I'm going to show you the geophysical signatures of a number of selected South Australian ISCG deposits using residual gravity and residual total magnetic intensity. My work with ISCG signatures has been to apply GIS and spatial statistics to classify geophysical data as a means of identifying known and potential ISCG deposits. The figure to the left shows the Gawler Craton within South Australia, with basement geology overlaying grayscale first vertical derivative of reduced to pole TMI. The Olympic Copper Gold Province covers the eastern side of the Gawler Craton and hosts more than 100 copper gold occurrences, deposits and mines, including the supergiant Olympic Dam, the fourth largest copper deposit in the world and the largest uranium deposit in the world. Other significant deposits and mines are labelled on the map. The figure to the right displays cover thickness and shows that most of the big South Australian ISCGs occur beneath hundreds of metres of younger cover, with no surface expression of the mineralisation below. These deposits have mineralisation from several hundred to well over 1,000 metres depth and in some cases exploration drill holes bottom out in high grade mineralisation. Gravity has been the primary ISCG exploration targeting data set in South Australia, followed by TMI. Early exploration drilled on gravity or magnetic anomalies, and many of the known deposits were discovered using this technique. However, drilling 1,000 plus metre drill holes is a very expensive exercise, and there's a real need to find ways to make discoveries using fewer drill holes. For this study, we've used the entire Grawler Craton as the study area, and treat residual gravity and TMI as populations of geophysical anomalies within that study area. These figures show the effect of the transformation from Bouger gravity and reduced to pole TMI to a residual gravity and TMI image. They also show the effect of the transformation from Bouger gravity and reduced to pole TMI to a first vertical derivative gravity and TMI image. In both cases, the effect of the transformation is to attenuate or suppress the deeper gravity and TMI response, which sharpens the detail of the shallower features within our study area. Note the units of the first VD images have changed and have values that I don't think convey the magnitude of anomalies as well as the milligals and Tesla units. This was the main reason for going with the residuals for both visualisation of geophysical signatures and the quantitative analysis I'm about to show you. Here are the magnetic and gravity signatures of the polymetallic supergiant Olympic Dam IOCGU deposit. In this series of images we have the TMI on the left, gravity on the right which includes the locations of gravity stations, and in the centre we have gravity and magnetic contour overlays. The overlays allow us to better see the spatial relationship between gravity and magnetic features, and also the perturbations within those broader features. In this and subsequent images, we'll see that the peaks of the gravity and magnetic anomalies are spatially offset, that is, they don't line up perfectly, and the deposit itself is offset from the gravity and magnetic peaks. This explains why some of these deposits required a number of drill holes to locate the high grade mineralisation and why we see a lot of near misses in the drilling. Next we see Word of Well. Once again we clearly see the offset between the peaks of spatially coincident gravity and magnetics and the location of the deposit some distance from the peak of the gravity and magnetic high. And of course we see the semi-coincident magnetic and gravity anomalies. The Carapatina deposit and adjacent Fremantle doctor continue this pattern. High grade mineralisation at Carapatina begins at about 600 metres depth and continues to well over 1000 metres. Note the small peak in the TMI image immediately to the east, which is right, of the deposit. Camsin lies adjacent to the Carapatina deposit, and here we see the usual pattern with a small bullseye TMI anomaly and a 2 milligal gravity anomaly. 
Oak Dam West was found to have high-grade copper and gold mineralisation from 1,063 metres and appears to have an absence of the expected magnetic anomaly. Possible reasons for this are that the iron content of the IOCG deposit may be non-magnetic hematite or the geometry of the deposit may be such that the magnetic feature to the southwest is the contributing magnetic feature. I'm taking you back to these regional images now to explain how we've used GIS and spatial statistics to provide some quantitative data on potential IOCG targets in the Olympic Copper Gold province. Geoprocessing of the residual grids converts these grids to vector features, capturing positive anomalies within the residual grids. This gives us statistical populations of anomalies that can be analysed for clustering patterns and these clustering patterns assist exploration targeting. It also permits us to overlay the features as seen in the previous slides and perform joint interpretation of gravity and magnetics. In the images, we see the results of a spatial clustering routine performed on the gravity grid on the left and the TMI grid on the right. The cluster analysis has statistically determined thresholds for what qualify as high magnitude anomalies, using all of the features in each population. In the case of the gravity data, the features considered high magnitude have landed on or in, are in close proximity to virtually all of the known deposits and occurrences, giving us confidence in the ability of the analysis to pick anomalies that are candidates for further investigation. The maps also show how high magnitude and low magnitude anomalies spatially cluster, and key cluster types have been found to coincide with geological domains that have a shared tectonic history and basement geology. Regions with a dispersed, discrete high magnitude anomalies among low magnitude features are tagged by the clustering algorithm as high-low outliers. These are the black anomalies among the green features on the map. The dark blue anomalies show areas where anomalism is more continuous with no low magnitude features between them. These are tagged as high, high clusters. It's these two classes of clustering in the gravity data that relate spatially to the known ISCGs shown by the yellow dots and the labelled deposits. Zooming in to the Olympic Copper Gold province, we see a number of occurrences in the north at the edge of the high clusters. We also see a number of occurrences in the south over a group of high clusters. In the central region we see mines and occurrences over high magnitude spatial outliers and this region is the most well endowed for IOCGs. It turns out that these three regions classified by the clustering of gravity anomalies each have their own geological character. The clusters in the north coincide with relatively shallow high metamorphic grade rocks. The cluster in the south and the position of occurrences within the clusters relate to metasomatic iron in the Munta domain, which is structurally controlled and located along shear zones. The spatial distribution of introduced iron is influenced by prior upper green schist to amphibolite facies metamorphism and deformation. In the central region, IOCG deposits are primarily hematite dominant and hosted in felsic intrusive rocks of the Donington and Hiltabur suite, or overlying low metamorphic grade metasedimentary rocks of the Wallaroo group, all of which have a relatively low background magnetite content. In this region, hydrothermally derived iron oxides form the clear gravity outliers. Alternative explanations for these gravity high outliers include mafic intrusive units and the development of SCARN both of which are known in the region and commonly occur in close proximity to IOCG deposits. This analysis doesn't distinguish between these alternatives, but does a good job of identifying the geophysical character that is permissive of IOCGs. It's worth noting here that the high magnitude gravity outlier class extends to the southwest across the Gaula Range Volcanics province. This area has had little exploration due to the thickness of the upper Gaula range volcanics, but probably warrant further investigation due to the nature of the gravity anomalies and the similarity of those anomalies with those in the more productive region. These last few slides revisit some of the known ISCG deposits, but now we can look at them in the context of where they sit in terms of clustering. The prominent hill deposits and mine 
sits near the perimeter of the high clusters at the margin of the high-grade metamorphic rocks and low metamorphic-grade metasedimentary rocks. The residual gravity anomaly is around 4 milligals, considered to be quite high. The coincident magnetic anomalies are present, but unlike gravity, high magnitudes are not necessarily considered better. The presence of a magnetic feature is interpreted by me to be more of an indicator of a potential ISCG system. The Olympic Dam IOCG is centrally located within the region of high magnitude gravity outliers and has a residual gravity anomaly of around 9 milligals, one of the largest anomalies in the region. The Alford East occurrence is an example of an IOCG occurrence in the southern region of IOCGs and the textures here are indicative of shear zone hosted iron. To finish off, the resolution of gravity magnetic surveys that feed into this study is shown in the current slide. As you can see, a variety of different survey resolutions was used. Although this work could be replicated with fairly low resolution gravity and TMI data, the best results would be obtained from data that can accurately map the positions of the peaks within any anomalous features. We believe 1000 meter gravity station spacing and 400 meter magnetic flight lines produce geophysical grids sufficient to carry out this analysis. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. The paper in the volume should fill in any gaps and provides additional detail not covered here. I'll finish with our disclaimer and acknowledgement of country. Thank you very much for listening.